Wir haben unsere zweite Q&A-Session jetzt ähm, mit äh, Pavel Richter. Bitte schön. Ähm, bevor wir beginnen, die Frage, Pavel hat auch angeboten, dass wir das äh, auf Englisch machen. Ähm, wer möchte, wer versteht nicht, wenn wir Deutsch, Deutsch sprechen? Wer versteht es nicht? <laughs> who doesn't understand German? So we have, wow, that's, that's, and who, who, who doesn't understand? Wer versteht kein Englisch? So, I think we'll do, we'll, we will do it in English then. We can alternate between we German or English. And, uh, sometimes it's easier for me to speak about open data in English, uh, and so I am German, uh, but all my job is in English. So, um, um, yeah, let's do it this way. Shall we, shall we do it this way in English? Uh, just as, as you like. A bit, a bit of your background, you studied political science, history and public law in Freiburg, Bielefeld, Ottawa, um, and you were responsible for Wikimedia in Germany, before you became the CEO of the Open, of Open Knowledge International. I'm getting, getting that right this time. Um, and you live in Berlin. Yes. That's correct. Before we, uh, we're going to do it the same as we did before. We will have a brief discussion and then I would like to open it up to you uh, for, for your questions. Um, but before we do, uh, maybe just, could you just outline what you actually do? <laughs> Yes, uh, most certainly. Well, first of all, thank you very much. It's my second time here at the, uh, at the conference. I, I was here two years ago, um, just weeks after I took over the job as CEO of Open Knowledge International. Back then, it was called Open Knowledge. Uh, we have a tendency to switch our names. Uh, maybe we're going to speak about this another time. Um, so, Open Knowledge International, um, we are the international uh, organizational wing of Open Knowledge as a movement. So uh, opendata.ch is the uh, Swiss chapter of open knowledge. Uh, there are uh, about 46 groups and chapters all over the world. Uh, and they do tremendous work where open data has the most impact. That is on a local level, on a national level. Uh, we have just seen two examples here. And you all know of a lot of other examples in your own municipalities or, or countries um, where open data actually has, um, makes a, a great impact. Yet there is, um, we believe, the need for uh, something global. Um, and that something is what is now called Open Knowledge International, founded by Rufus Pollock uh, uh, in 2004. So we are a rather old organization in that space. Um, we are focusing, uh, so we have, we have been doing quite a lot um, uh, over that period of, of nearly 13 years now, for nearly 14 years now. Um, uh, we did a lot of software. Um, uh, the most prominent one is CCAN, um, the data portal software that runs basically a lot of the uh, very large and very small data portals. Um, we have been um, very much engaged in uh, making budget data uh, available through a project like Open Spending. Um, we have been um, engaged in measuring openness on a global level uh, called the Global Open Data Index and um, a lot of other things. Um, but when I took over the, the, the position as CEO, um, my, one of the very first things was to ask myself and, and then the organization and a lot of people within our movement about what is it where we, with our limited resources, we have like 35 people uh, who are working all over the world, um, what, can, what is it where we can have the, the, the most, the, the global impact? And we came up with what I don't really like to call a strategy. I like to call it a purpose. Um, or uh, there's a very nice German word for it called Bestimmung. Um, so the purpose or Bestimmung of the organization, which in one sentence is to empower civil society organizations to use open data to improve people's lives. And in that sentence, to empower civil society organizations to use open data to improve people's lives are three fundamental assumptions. One is uh, our main partners as an international organization are other civil society organizations. So we are not working directly with activists on the ground uh, because we do believe that, uh, that uh, national chapters uh, 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 um, and, and uh, uh, like-minded groups are well be much better positioned than we as a global organization to do so. And on the other side, we are not 
as heavily engaging with governments as we used to in the past. We are working with governments from time to time, but most of our uh, work goes into partnering with civil society organizations. The, the second assumption is we are really into open data. Uh, that might sound like, a, uh, uh, like, a, um, uh, like something like common uh, knowledge, but it's not, because we as an organization have been working on quite a lot of open things, from open science, uh, open access, open culture, a lot of openness. Um, and we are now focusing on the technical aspects of all this, so open data. And the third one is, which is very close to myself and what, what, what drives me as a, as a person, it is that I don't think that openness per se is anything interesting, sexy, or is changing the world. Um, if we cannot prove that open data actually makes a difference on people's lives, and of course a good, Im uh, a good impression on people's lives, we are not able to show that openness and open data can improve and how they improve people's lives then we have failed. Um, so uh, the, the approach, build it and they will come, uh, is something that worked quite well in the past. But I believe we as, an, or as organizations in that space need to um, keep our side of the bargain and show the actual impact. And, and the things that we have heard today here are actually that, that impact on people's lives. Could, yeah, can, can you give us an example of what that is then? What do you do to, to not just put the data out there, but to get people to... We, we, before we, we heard about yeah. creating authorities to kind of bring along the problem as well, not that just the data is. What, what, what is your strategy to, to do this? To do? Yeah, so um, one, uh, let's, let's use two, um, um, two examples. Um, one is um, we work together with um, human rights organizations to identify um, the value open data can bring to the mission of human rights organizations. I have no idea if there is any value uh, in using open data for human rights. Very few work has been done on this. There are examples of, uh, of where open data has been used to foster human rights. But we do what we want to do is we want to, instead of us as an organization saying this is the next big shit where we want to work on, uh, we want to talk to the organizations like human rights groups, but you can take environmental organizations um, uh, and any other kind of civil society organizations and work with them, understand their mission and try to, um, try to find out how if and how open data can help them um, um, do their mission and, and execute their mission better. So human rights is what we as an organization have chosen as a domain where we believe uh, 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 it's worthwhile to evaluate and see the kind of impact open data can have on, on such a domain. And, and a second ex example, which is very much in line with what you have just discussed around the, uh, the Swiss um, uh, SBB and the, the um, Postal Service, is um, uh, EnergyNet. It's a Dan Danish um, electricity grid provider, so they run all the el electricity grids in, in Denmark, and they just published um, all um, energy data um, in um, uh, in, the, uh, in Denmark, uh, on a, um, it's all open data, it's aggregated on a municipality level and it's near, time, near real time. Um, so it's a huge undertaking for a small country to make all that data available and they, what they actually do is they have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, so they simply put it out there and said we believe in making it available, uh, the data is, our, is, is there and we just need to make it available and that's something that, where we have been very much involved. Um, and now we're going to see what's going to happen and who's going to make good use of that data. Um, so these are very, two very different approaches, but they show a little bit the direction that we are trying to take. Maybe taking another step back again, um, sort of on, on the, from the meta level, it does look as though that the, the pendulum or the momentum is swinging backwards towards less openness. If you look at the kind of broad political debate, especially in the US, um, is that something that... that that, uh, the, that you feel do you need to get involved in and, 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 and sort of swing, help swing back? Or what, 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 is, what, is, mm -hmm. yeah, what is the open knowledge, of, yeah. what's your take on that? So quite honestly, I, I do believe that we are not um, a, a very good advocacy organization. We are not a good lobbying organization. Lobbying and advocacy is something, it's a skill, it's an art, it's something you need to be very experienced in. You need to have um, the right people and you need to have the, the experience 
two things that we as an organization are lacking. So um, we don't uh, do classical advocacy. Um, what, we, uh, what I think uh, is, a, is a very interesting, and there are other organizations, if you take, for example, in the US, the Sunlight Foundation is a very good example of an organization that really knows what, how uh, advocacy in, in, in political Washington really works. And, and they do a tremendous job. And, and other organizations do this uh, in other countries as well. Um, so I don't think that we as a global organization are very well positioned to do that. Um, what I do find interesting, um, I do agree that the pendulum um, is swinging back. So openness um, was never without uh, enemies. Um, of course, everybody paid lip service to um, openness and open data. But of course, openness threatens uh, power. It's, it, by nature, it does. Uh, power feels much better uh, and uh, is much more effective uh, in a closed environment. And as the more open an environment becomes, uh, the more the classical and structural power uh, is threatened and it's, it's questioned and has to be accountable. And that's threatening to people in power. And uh, what we see in, uh, uh, in the US happening, but I don't like to blame the US. We see this uh, uh, in the UK as well. We see this in, any, in a lot of other countries is that um, uh, now that open data and openness has become way more um, uh, common, um, that um, the, the, the pendulum has a tendency to swing back. And the, what, what happens in the US, for example, right after Donald Trump got elected, um, a lot of scientists started um, to download um, uh, databases and put them uh, in secure saver, uh, servers outside, of, uh, outside uh, of the US. That sounds, of course, there is a marketing uh, aspect in here. That is a, it's a very dramatic thing, and you can highlight the value. But it also shows uh, one of the key arguments that we have done, that we all have made for open data for I wouldn't say for centuries, but for quite a long time. That is that once data is open, um, it's out of the control of, for example, governments. And governments can change, and power structures can change. And one of the great things of open data is that I can take it and put it somewhere else in a safer place, be that Greenland, Canada, or uh, the Philippines. Um, and I think that's, um, so we see it, it's more under threat, but I also see that it works as a concept because the data is not lost. Um, it can be secured and it can be reused outside of the classical structures of governments, for example. Using your CCAM technology, for instance. <laughs> of course, it's free, it's uh, open source, you can use it uh, um, however you want. Okay, um, I'd like to open up now to, to you. Uh, to any questions you have to Pavel. Um, I mean, basically anybody in Switzerland can approach you with their uh, open data concerns or ideas and plans. That, that's right. Of course. So yes. anybody who would like to do that could do that now or afterwards, of course. Um, but please, please go ahead. Then let me... Uh, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question while uh, the microphone is going um, um, to to you over there. Um, is Switzerland becoming more open over the last five years? Do you see a backlash happening on a local level, municipality level, on a national level, or is Switzerland on a uh, on a, a, a road to more openness uh, in that general terms? Any um, any show of hands or any um, um, opinion on that would be very interesting. So why don't we do the poll? <laughs> we'll ask the question first, and we'll do that afterwards. Yeah. Hi. Um, does openness indeed challenge power, as long as you do not have open data by default, and governments get to pick and choose what data sets they open? Or does it fortify power, maybe, as well? Mm. I think that no, open data in itself does not challenge power. Uh, open data is simply there and it sits there. So it's, of course, about what you do with it. But I do believe that the overall concept um, of openness um, that can be around open data, but my, my, my other background in openness is, is the Wikimedia movement and, and Wikipedia. Um, and uh, the, the concept. Take, for example, something very different, um, uh, like open educational resources. So the, uh, the idea um, to create learning materials 
by the people who are doing the learning, while they are doing the learning, and then put this all under a, under a, a free license. The, 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 uh, the concept does not only threaten the business model of classical publishing houses, that, that's one aspect of it, but it more changes the way how we acquire knowledge and how we learn as an organization and as students and as, as professionals. And therefore, the idea behind open educational resources challenges um, the r classical power structures of a university, of a school, um, of professional learning. Um, um, not necessarily, and I think we need to be very careful, not necessarily to the best. Um, there is, of course, um, a risk in here involved. So I'm not saying that automatically the result will be better. Um, I would just say the result will be more open. So I'd say the, the concept of openness challenges uh, classical um, uh, old uh, structures. And it questions them, and it needs to, they then need to um, uh, reaffirm themselves and, and um, be more accountable. But in the end, um, open data is, is usable for everybody. And you can do bad and, and, and horrible things with open data. I'm, I, I honestly don't have an example, but I'm pretty sure that open data is being used for, and has been used, and will be used for bad things as well. Because the data itself, itself of course, is, a, is agnostic. But the, the concept, Itself, I think is a progressive one and a, and a liberal, liberating one. By the way, we can have the Q and A. We can have questions in German as well. Just um, if you feel more comfortable in asking in German, um, please feel free. Of course. Uh, I have a remark because normally this assumption about open data is something like uh, thinking about uh, a community of citizens that uh, we here, we want to know what is going on and so on. But of course, if you have data really, really 100% open, uh, so it means that it's available for, for anybody. Uh, and some people are more friendly, some are less friendly. And uh, also, even if you, let's say, anonymize data, with clever, uh, clever algorithms, you can maybe re identify people or know some uh, patterns that can be, you know, used use by as a, uh, as a guy, so to speak, let's say to launch a cyber attack or, or something like that. At least it's a cyber attack. And, uh, and it also, it was discussion about open science, you know, that who is funding the research, and as far as for example, Swiss uh, universities are, are publishing stuff that is used then for, by Swiss industry that more or less is a balanced business. But of course, making, doing high cost research and making it public for everybody in the world, it's another, uh, another story. So this is, uh, you know, it's very easy to, to forget, you know, the rest of the world simply. Yeah. Two things I would like to say to that. Um, one is, um, uh, and uh, we, uh, I, I heard about that uh, earlier um, in the previous session, um, about uh, privacy, or as we say in the UK, privacy, and uh, open data. Uh, and I do um, uh, think that it's an interesting uh, discussion, um, but I would rather switch it over to um, data ownership and uh, the question of um, uh, shared, what I would call shared data ownership. So. Um, if I give my data to Facebook, which I do um, on a regular basis, or to Google, or to any one of the other big uh, companies, they own that data. And I, I'm fine with that. I really am. I think it's OK that they own the data. It's the business model. It's why I can use it for free. And if I don't want to use it, I don't use their services. So I'm fine with that. But what I'm not fine with is that I'm not uh, that I'm not a co-owner of that data. I think I should be a co-owner of that data. I should have access to my data, to all my data in a machine-readable and open format that I ever produce um, on Google, Facebook, Twitter, or wherever. And then um, they can use my data to do their business case, but I can use my data as well, share it with another organization, share it with a non-profit, share it with whoever I want. Um, so that's my, my answer to data, to data privacy, uh, to privacy and, uh, and, and open data is more about ownership of data than to regulate the, um, the overall um, approach here. The, the second aspect that you, that you mentioned is um, um, 
about the, what I would call leveling. I think open data can really level the playing field. So um, if I Google and I want data, I simply buy it. Um, uh, I don't care if it's open or not, um, because I have the resources. And if it's not for sale, then I lobby uh, and make it for sale, and then I buy it. So um, data is there, and it's available to the powerful and to the rich. Um, and open data and, and advocating for open data is leveling that playing field just a little bit maybe, but it is leveling it um, so that nonprofit organizations, civil society organizations, scientists, activists have access to data they will never be able to afford and buy like Google or Facebook could buy um, by data. And therefore, I do believe that the concept in itself is, level, uh, is making data more available to the ones who do not have access. The ones who have access are usually the ones who are able to pay for it. Uh, and I think that's an important aspect of, of open data that's often overlooked, that the data is out there anyway. Uh, it's for sale right now, and you can buy it if you want to. But if you don't have the money, then you need it to be open data. That's also somewhere that, that I found your point interesting about Google and Facebook, sharing the user's data with the users, something that companies that could lead on, like the post office or the SPB, they could share their users' data back to them. Yeah. And there is a great, um, a great project called My Data from Open Knowledge Finland. Um, uh, I think you find it under mydata.org, um, which um, has, is a concept exactly around this co-ownership and having then um, uh, organizations, public organizations like telecom organizations or civil society organizations <laughs> working as brokers who store your data on your behalf and you then, uh, through an API, allow other organizations as you want to, to, to use your own data. And if you, for example, have your medical data there and you suffer from a rare disease, uh, it might be beneficial for you to share that data. I don't want to have my medical data published, um, but if I want it to be published, I want to have access to all the data that I ever produced with my doctors, with my hospitals, and then make it available. Because, hey, this is about me. Um, it's my body, it's my health, and I want to make that choice uh, um, to open it um, or not. Um, or to open just a piece of it, uh, or only my blood type, or whatever I find interesting. And that concept of, of co-ownership of data um, uh, and putting me in control as well as allowing others to use it, uh, I think is, uh, is an interesting concept. I'm not an expert on this, so I can only speak to the people who do my data, invite them for the next conference if you haven't done so, because they're, they're really, really great when it comes to exactly that question about um, how do we deal with um, ownership of data uh, in, in a data-rich world. There is this uh, general data protection regulation, right, that comes into effect in the EU on the 25th of May, which has an article 20, which states that yep. the companies need to provide that data to all of their users without them asking in machine-readable format. I think we'll see a lot of that development next year. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's a very great aspect of that, um, of that law. I understand that there are other aspects of that very same law that are very troubling, um, but I'm not an expert on that either, but I'm sure other people in this room are. Um, maybe an unusual question, but um, do you think that open data might lead to more inequality between people? Because open data might lead to more inequality because, for example, tech-savvy people might access or benefit from information more, exponentially more, than other people, maybe? I think my... Um, so I, I, I don't want to sound like an evangelist for, for open data. Even so, it's maybe part of my job description. Um, but I, I do see the critical aspects of, uh, of open data. But the, when it comes to, uh, to equality or inequality, I would say I would give basically the very same answer I already did around um, companies versus civil society organizations. The data is there. It's about who has access to it and what are the barriers of access. Uh, 
with open data and openness, inequality is not uh, disappearing overnight. Uh, inequality is a political... <laughs> People are benefiting from inequality. Companies are benefiting from inequality. So as long as people and organizations and governments, and we all benefit uh, from inequality, that's the reason why our, all our clothes are so cheap, because we benefit from the inequality of, low la uh, of cheap labor um, in uh, China and other developing countries. As long as that is a fact, then open data will not change that. As long as we do not change our behavior, um, inequality. So, uh, what I say is, inequality is a, is a complex issue uh, that lies, the, the responsibility lies with the all, within all of us and the governments that we are electing. Um, and I would say that open data can again level the, la the, the playing field. But on the other side, I'd like to say that um, you should not use technical tools to s try to solve social problems. And therefore, looking at open data as a solution for inequality would actually ignore the political and economic realities behind inequality in general. Thanks a lot for that. Before we finish, I would really like to do that poll, though. The, uh, the, uh, who, who, who thinks that Switzerland's becoming more open now? And less open. <laughs> so I think that the answers that that's that's, <laughs> that's that's a clear answer. Everybody in Every, the room is agreeing. It's, <laughs> it's getting way more. It, it is getting more open. There and, was no uh, hands for non-open. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I be, be, before we close? I'd like to make a little announcement because um, uh, obviously your um, group interested in uh, in openness and open data. Um, we uh, just a couple of weeks ago announced as an organization that. We're going to have a, a large festival around openness and open data called OK Fest. The older people within the room, you know, my age, remember that there has been one in 2014 in Berlin called OK Fest 2014. And the next one is called OK Fest 2018 because it's happening from the 3rd to the 6th of May uh, 2018 in the beautiful uh, city of Thessaloniki in Greece. Um, and so if you want to put it in your calendar, uh, everything between the 3rd and the uh, 6th of May 2018, and if you want to bookmark the site, the site 2018.okfestival.org, um, or, or just look at the uh, at my Twitter handle pa at Pavel or at the Open Knowledge Twitter handle, you're going to find all the information there. So 2018.okfestival.org, um, Thessaloniki in May is amazing, uh, and it's about open data. So you have two great things uh, at once, isn't that? Isn't that a treat? All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. For that. Thanks. My pleasure.